Good evening from New York. The infiltration of U.S. government facilities in New Orleans and the attempt to somehow alter the office phone system of a sitting U.S. senator was not, it turns out, just the work of one right-wing, quote, journalist, unquote, but in fact four right-wing men who were not pranksters on the conservative fringe, but rather recruits of, mainstays of, and the prospective future of the right-wing's bedrock institutions. And we know more today about the operation inside the office of Louisiana Democratic Senator Mary Landrieu. As law enforcement officials officials tell NBC News the federal government believes the defendants were not trying to intercept or tap phone calls, but believe that Senator Landrieu's office was unresponsive to calls from critics of health care reform and wanted to document whether her office responded to a total shutdown of its phones by laughing it off or expressing some sort of concern about constituents being unable to reach them. Entering under false pretenses to cut off a senator's phones, wiretap or not, is, guess what, also a crime punishable by up to 10 years in prison. Defendant James O'Keefe has already admitted to taping the events and new reports from unnamed officials today that one of the two bogus phone repairmen wore a tiny hidden camera rigged into his hard hat. Co-defendant James Dye, arrested in a car down the street, had what sources have reportedly described as a listening device. But the defendants are not random pranksters from outside the right-wing mainstream. As we learn more about their backgrounds, it turns out they are, in fact, cultivated, nurtured products of the same Republican establishment now desperately trying to disown them tonight. O'Keefe, we already knew, posted videos of what he used to describe as pranks and then began to call journalism on the website of the conservative drudge protege Andrew Breitbart. Breitbart Bart now admitting O'Keefe was on his payroll on salary while denying any knowledge of this latest event. O'Keefe is a favorite GOP speaker, including to at least one Tea Party rally in St. Louis. And as recently as 2006 and 2007, he was on another right-wing payroll, working as a campus recruiter for the right-wing training facility, the Leadership Institute, which says on its website, quote, the Leadership Institute does not analyze policy. It trains conservatives how to win. Led by longtime conservative activist Morton Blackwell, the Institute's campus group, Campus Reform, interviewed both O'Keefe and co-defendant Joseph Basil, past recipient of the Leadership Institute seed money, on the 14th of this month and wrote, quote, to protect their ongoing investigations, we can't say exactly when or where the interview was conducted. Basil, another party mainstay, attended the Bush 2005 inauguration, is a Facebook fan of the Tea Party Patriots, and managed the successful 2006 campaign of now State Senator Bill Ingrabritson, Republican of Minnesota. Co-defendant Robert Flanagan, son of an acting U.S. attorney, was a paid employee of the right-wing Pelican Institute, about a block away from Landrieu's office, which had O'Keefe as a speaker, did the Institute just last week. Last year, Flanagan interned for Republican Congresswoman Mary Fallon of Oklahoma, co-sponsor of a recent GOP resolution honoring O'Keefe. Mr. Dye has equally impressive connections in the Republican Party, claiming to have been operations officer of a Pentagon counterterrorism program during the Bush presidency, recipient of a $5,000 grant from the Phillips Foundation, started by Robert Novak and kept going by right-wing publisher Alfred Regnery, and a former undergraduate fellow on terrorism at the Foundation for the Defense of the Democracies. Its leadership council, Newt Gingrich, Robert McFarland, Joe Lieberman, Bill Kristol, you get the idea. Reporting on this story for MSNBC tonight, David Schuster, who of course anchors our dayside coverage at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. each weekday and is back on his old beat, Scandal Watch, tonight in New Orleans. David, good evening. Good evening, Keith. Based on today's reporting, should we not expect further charges then? Are the outlines of the crime complete in the prosecutor's mind at this point? Well, Keith, a couple of things. First of all, there is a grand jury that is available to the prosecutor should the prosecutor develop new information. However, this does not appear to be shaping up as any sort of a wiretap case. Instead, all of the information, of course, is that it's a federal trespassing case. There are strong indications that the, uh, each of the witnesses, uh, each of the people who are in this criminal complaint, Keith, have started talking and that prosecutors will simply try to corroborate their stories, make sure that they're all essentially telling the same stories, but also try to determine, Keith, whether or not there was a particular ringleader? Was there any incentive, for example, that James O'Keefe gave to his colleagues to participate in this? And there's always the possibility, as prosecutors will say, Keith, that there can be a superseding indictment, that you can bring additional charges based on the information that is developed, and that in the course of perhaps trying to reach a plea deal, that if somebody becomes a government witness, they could have their charges reduced. Let's get into the weeds of this a little bit. The listening device that Stan Dye allegedly had, according to the Associated Press, 
uh, last night. If that if that's not a wiretapping attempt, is there another explanation for what that phrase listening device means? Yeah, Keith, sources are familiar with the case are suggesting that this was some, some sort of walkie-talkie, maybe even a cell phone that Dai had in that van, and that he was in communication with O'Keefe, who was upstairs on the 10th floor of that building behind me. It's not clear whether or not Stan Dai had the ability to either record on this cell phone or this walkie-talkie, but rather that he was in communication with the people upstairs. Again, the, the description of this as a, a listening device, that was from a law enforcement source, and it may have been a little bit misleading. There is every indication that the people upstairs on the 10th floor were communicating with the guy, Stan Dye, who was down in the truck. But again, it looks like it's as simple an explanation as some sort of walkie-talkie, perhaps even a cell phone with a walkie-talkie device connected to it. It does beg the question what he's doing down there, but I'm sure they've already raised that one. Um, something in the language of that January 14th piece from the Leadership Institute's campus group suggests they knew O'Keefe and Basil were up to something. Um, O'Keefe was on Breitbart's payroll for written work, Exclusively, does this investigation need to expand? Does it seem likely to? Are prosecutors looking into the backgrounds as, as everybody else seems to be of the four men involved? Well, they will. I mean, I spoke to Andrew Breitbart today, who said flat out that the last time he spoke with James O'Keefe was several weeks ago, and they had no earthly idea that James O'Keefe was up to this. But again, that's something for the prosecutors to determine. I mean, prosecutors will tell you that they have to essentially figure out, was there any financial incentive with all the people that had financial connections to James O'Keefe? Did they give him any incentive? When If O'Keefe tells prosecutors, look, I did this completely on my own, there's a due diligence that prosecutors have to follow to make sure so you can expect that Andrew Breitbart and some of the rest will eventually get calls from investigators and there may be it may be absolutely true that they had nothing to do with this but the prosecutors are going to follow this they're not just going to keep take the word of James O'Keefe and the rest they're going to try to make sure that the funding here that you can explain that uh, how this came about it's too bad there isn't videotape about what went actually went on in there. Oh, there's, there is, isn't there? MSNBC's David Schuster, who airs weekdays at uh, 10 and 3 on the network. Uh, great thanks for your reporting tonight from New Orleans. Thanks, Keith. With us tonight, another echo of Watergate here is the former White House counsel for President Nixon, author of Blind Ambition, John Dean. Uh, John, welcome back. Good to talk to you again. Thank you, Keith. So is this a prank? Is it a caper or is it a third-rate burglary? <laughs> well, it's certainly not a prank. Uh, it, it's pretty serious. I think it happened, from what I can piece together, it looks like it's more continuation of O'Keefe's entrapment journalism that he was working on. Uh, it's a pretty nasty stuff. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something they're trying to get people to say things they shouldn't or find situations where they can record them and then embarrass them and hurt them in some way. And it's pretty mean-spirited stuff that they've gone beyond uh, what is legal to try to accomplish. Uh, it must be, however, as mean-spirited stuff goes, it, may, it must sound awfully familiar to you because the, the training school quality to the backgrounds of these guys, their roots. Has not the college Republican machine been turning out people like James O'Keefe for a lot longer than James O'Keefe has been alive? Well, I I indeed it has. I think uh, Carl Rove was one of the early tutors that went around campuses to instruct people on how to do these sorts of things. Uh, how far Carl went uh, as the mechanics, I don't know. Uh, but that's uh, certainly legendary on the right that this sort of activity is acceptable. And also the fact that O'Keefe's work has been so applauded by his, his elders, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, has been nothing but encouragement for this kind of activity. Is this not to some degree reminiscent of Donald Gretty and that whole crowd from uh, from the campuses of the of the mid 60s. Uh, Keith, I, I can't believe the stupidity of it all. Uh, you know, we've been there, done that. People have, have, have realized the mistakes that were made. Uh, it, it, it really is stupid that they would do this sort of thing uh, or try to continue to do these kinds of things at, at this late stage. You'd think we would evolve in our political intelligence at some point. <laughs> well, we can both wait. Um, explain <laughs> something legal for this and, and with your, with your first-hand experience on this so many years ago. Go, particularly how how can this be can this be a conspiracy without being a directed conspiracy in other words you wind these guys up in college in internships in these you know of this plethora of different uh, training hot houses and then you give them a certain mindset and you what you just let them run loose on their own devices 
Well, you know, the fact of a, a conspiracy in the law is when two or more people agree to undertake a le illegal act and one person takes an overt step to further that agreement. Uh, it, it, clearly, this is a classic criminal conspiracy with these guys and what they did. How far back it reaches and who, who all the co-conspirators are, we don't know yet. If this is something that happened where uh, somebody else in their uh, like-thinking crowd said, why don't you do something like such and so, uh, they could well be pulled into the conspiracy. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I think the investigators are going to be looking at and try to resolve because uh, this may be more than four people. Are we correct to suggest that these guys are not outliers f away from the Republican mainstream, but they are more representative of the mindset, the tactics, and maybe the ethics uh, of the people running the party and the institutions that nurtured these guys? Well, I'd certainly say that's true given the endorsement of the kinds of activities in the past uh, when they've engaged in this sort of thing where they've illegally recorded people at ACORN, the, uh, the kinds of telephone calls they've recorded to embarrass people. Uh, they've used this before. So I, I think this has been embraced by the Republican right uh, and those who indeed control the party today. I, I think that they're clearly trying to distance themselves mm. now, but uh, uh, they encouraged it. John Dean, uh, Nixon White House counsel, author of Conservatives Without Conscience. As always, great thanks. And, and who never knew we'd be talking about something this specific to your background. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. The possible absence of more does not mean there is not enough. If the Louisiana senator in question had been named Vitter, the demands for a congressional investigation might drown out the State of the Union address tonight. Will the Senate inquire in defense of the security of one of its Democratic members? And where is this going politically? Quick comment, and Richard Wolf next. Years from now, how will we look back on today? As the Great Recession, or as the recession that made us great? All state has seen 12 recoveries, but this one's different, because we're different. We realize our things are not as important as the future we're building with the ones we love.